My name is Sarah, and I'm from Spokane, Washington, and I'm going to try my hand at telling the true scary story of something that happened to me during a solo camping trip last fall. I know that might sound stupid of me, a young woman heading out to camp on her lonesome in an estate that's produced 30 confirmed serial killers, but I carry a gun, so there's that. I know it's not complete protection, but it makes me feel so much safer knowing that I have that option for self-defense. And so, it was last October when I decided to head up to Snow Lake. I wanted to de-stress and unwind with some peace, quiet, and nice views, but I also didn't want the trails to be too tough, so Snow Lake seemed perfect. It's also one of the more popular trails in the Snoqualmie Pass area, and to me it always seemed like a good thing if there were other campers or hikers around because you never know when you're going to need someone's help. I'm so over that I'd choose the bear bullcrap. Like, tell me you're not a hiker without telling me you're not a hiker. 99% of people you meet on trails are awesome folks. Even the mountain bikers you run into out there are way nicer than the joggers and cyclists I've met in the city. But I guess on this one particular occasion, I ran into the exception which proves the rule, as they say. I hiked about 4 or 5 miles down the trail before I made my camp, which I made sure to keep out of sight from the main trail for privacy's sake. I was pretty worn out from the hike, so after setting up my tent and unpacking the essentials, then making a campfire and warming up some food, I decided to call it a night at around 9pm. I remember getting into my sleeping bag, then trying to make a kind of pillow out of my pack and rolled up sweater, and then nothing. I must have dozed off less than a minute after putting my head down. The next thing I remember is dreaming that my sister and I were in the back of my dad's car. I don't know where we were going, but my sister kept teasing me about a crush that I had and I kept asking my dad to tell her to stop and he wasn't saying anything. And after that, I have this vivid memory of hearing the sound of a zipper being pulled in the car. It was super loud and I looked around but I couldn't see where it was coming from. And then I suddenly had this super clear split second thought of, oh my god I need to wake up, I'm in a dream and there's a zipper of my tent that I'm hearing. The sudden transition from the light of the sunlit backseat to the darkness of my tent is something I will never forget, because I went from unconsciousness to consciousness with that same singular thought. Get your gun, and get it quick. I put hours in on the range with this thing, and it's only a 9mm m and shield, but it's small, easy to conceal, and very easy to use. The only trouble was... I'd never been in a situation where I thought that I would need to use it, and my shooting instructor was right. The adrenaline dump is so, so real. Even with all the hours I'd put in, it was a struggle to operate it and bring it to bear, and all the while, the zipper of my tent is slowly coming down. You could hear that zip noise just about drowning out the sound of me arming my M&P. At least I'm assuming whoever it was didn't hear it because... The unzipping didn't stop until I spoke up. I probably sounded scared out of my mind as I said, but I still tried to sound as fierce as possible as I said something along the lines of, Get away from my tent if you don't want to die right here. And the zipping stopped. But the silence that followed meant whoever was out there hadn't moved. I then told them that I had a gun pointed at that entrance and if I didn't hear the sound of them getting up and walking away in the next five seconds, I was going to start shooting. Then, there was movement. I heard someone stand, then heard them take a few steps back before their pace picked up, and I figured they'd started running. I mean, I'd run if someone in the woods just threatened to shoot me, but they didn't. Instead, I heard them walking away, their footfalls getting lighter and lighter as they got further away, and then silence. I couldn't tell if the silence was because their footsteps just faded out or because they'd stopped walking and were now just hanging back from a distance and waiting to see what I'd do next. The thought paralyzed me, and I lay there, gun pointed at the zipper for what must have been minutes before I finally found the will to move again. Since I was only five miles into the trail, I still had some spotty cell signal, presumably from a tower back near the highway, so... I was able to call 911 from my tent. The dispatch guy said that he could notify the King County Sheriff's Office, but 
that he could get a couple of forest rangers out to me on ATVs within 20 minutes, he thought. He said not to be alarmed if I heard their engines roaring in the darkness and to hear it as more like a cavalry coming. And it really did sound like that when the rangers did finally show up, but that was a long 20 minutes or so that I had to wait there in the darkness, listening out for any signs of footsteps coming closer again. When the rangers showed up, I told them what happened, and they took a look around to make sure that there was nobody lurking nearby. They couldn't see anyone, but they did find the person's trail leading off into the trees. And so if they were hiding out and waiting for me to let my guard down, they weren't doing it nearby. But that didn't make me feel any better or safer, so I took the rangers up on their offer to give me a ride back towards where my car was parked so I could drive home. It was the first time anything like that has happened to me, and for the record, nothing like that has ever happened since, but I was still really shaken up at the time, and not even for the reasons you might expect. I don't know if you've ever been close to shooting someone before, and I'm sure you don't need anyone to tell you this, but it was not a pleasant experience. I'd love to be that girl who can sound all badass telling everyone how cold she was getting ready to smoke some pervert trying to sneak into her tent at night, but I wasn't ready, and for all the preparation I'd done, I don't think I'd ever have been ready to take someone's life, no matter what they were doing. My instructor mentioned that too, how the fear sometimes leads to reasoning. You think pulling out a gun is going to make someone stop and throw their hands up like in the movies, but the real world isn't like that at all. If you're going to pull your gun on someone, he said, you better be prepared to use it because if you don't, there's a chance they'll take it from you and use it on you instead. I don't know how far I'd have let that guy go before pulling that trigger. I really don't. I'd definitely have shot him if he tried to grab me or if I saw him holding a weapon of his own, but I think I'd have literally begged and pleaded with him to stop before I finally put that bullet in him. I think the whole thing shook me up so much. It wasn't just because it was scary for me, and it was very scary. It was because... It made me really think for the first time about the possibility of taking someone's life. With the self-defense classes I took, the instructor was awesome, but looking back he only ever said things like neutralizing the target or ending the threat. And I know that was to try and shield me mentally from the realities of what I was doing. I was practicing to kill someone. And let me tell you, that feels a whole lot different than actually getting ready to go through with it. I found your channel a few weeks back and I saw you took some missions so this is the scariest true story that I know 100% happened. Six years ago, almost to the day, my best friend's dad went camping up in the Northwest Territories here in Canada to a place called Rolf Lake. To anyone listening that might not sound like anything to worry about, but if you knew my friend's dad, you'd know how weird and out of character it was. He left for the territories in September and said that he'd be back within just a few weeks. He hadn't been camping since he was a kid, but the weird thing was, he hated outdoor activities. He was a real indoor cat, liked his doodads and gadgets and stuff, and then all of a sudden, he takes this bizarre interest in camping, buys himself a bunch of equipment, and then boom, one day he announced that he was leaving. The other weird thing is that he took the family's two dogs with him, and this is especially weird because he hated those dogs. The only reason the family had them in the first place was because his wife and kids pestered him daily for years. He refused to walk them, pick up after them. It was a case of, those aren't my dogs, so that's not my job. He barely even liked being in the same room as those smelly old mutts, as he used to put it. But then just like he seemed to totally change overnight when it came to the camping thing, he did the same things with the dogs. He suddenly decided that he didn't spend enough time with them, and that they deserved to go on an adventure instead of just lying around the house all day waiting to be fed or walked. I mean, I think he's kind of right on that point, but like I said, it was completely out of character for him, to the point that my buddy and his family started to worry that he was going through some kind of midlife crisis. But then, what else could they do other than just leave him be and let him get it out of his system? 
and then have a talk with him when he got back about his new strange behavior. But then, he didn't come back when he said he would. In fact, he never came back at all. After he didn't come back on the date that he said he would, my friend's family reported him missing. The cops said a search and rescue team would take a look around Rolf Lake for any signs of him, but weeks turned into months and there was no trace of my buddy's dad anywhere. No one wanted to believe that he was dead, especially not my friend or his family, but by the end of March, he'd been missing for more than five months and people were starting to give up hope. The weather was a big factor, as no one believed that he could survive the winter up there in the territories, especially since he had no experience camping. But then, in early April sometime, a pilot was flying over the area for some reason when they spotted a guy in what looked like two dogs walking near Rolf Lake. The pilot reported the sighting to someone. I don't think he was an official search and rescue dude, but he must have known about my friend's dad being missing out there because I heard he reported it ASAP. The RCMP, along with an actual search and rescue team, was then sent to look over the area, and after less than a day of searching they found his campsite. They found wooden tent poles on the ground, some boating wax, a tent, dog supplies, but the man himself had apparently moved on. The boating wax thing was another weird aspect because it suggested my friend's dad had sort of a canoe or something with him. My friend's dad had never once gone canoeing, had zero interest in it, to anyone's knowledge, and no one seemed aware of him buying a canoe before he left for the territories. After a second round of searching, the cops told my friend's family that they figured his dad was somewhere in Yellowknife, the largest town up there in the territories. They'd searched all around Rolf Lake and found no other traces of my friend's father, and so they moved their search to areas like Yellowknife, but then later to a place called Prince George because apparently he had an old college friend who lived out that way and it was possible that he'd stop by for a visit but there's no evidence whatsoever that he did that. And unless the friend in Yellowknife is covering for him for some reason, he's telling the truth when he says that my friend's dad never came by to visit him. But in that case, where did he go? And where is he now? It's kind of brutal to say it out loud or even write it down openly in this case, but pretty much everyone assumes my friend's dad is most probably no longer with us. He went from being resentful of having to take the dogs on walks to having a sudden interest in camping and canoeing, and unless he'd secretly been mastering survival techniques, which I guess isn't out of the question, then he was probably way in over his head and didn't realize it until it was too late. One of the things the Mounties told my friend's family was that, even in the summertime, the rivers and lakes up in that area stay icy cold all year round. So even in April, with the seasons changing and the snow melting, it might look like a nice day for a trip downstream, but fall in that water without anyone to drag you out in time, and you might never get out again. They also said that there's a chance wild animals got to his remains, in which case there won't be much left of him to find except his clothes and equipment. But to me, that's just the thing. It all makes much more sense if my friend's dad doesn't want to be found. But no one believes that he's still living out there like some kind of 21st century mountain man. He was a house cat all his life, like I said, and I get that he might have had some radical change of heart, but it all just seems so unlikely, you know? And I sometimes think that he got into some kind of accident, like the whole freezing cold water thing, or that maybe a bear had gotten to him or something, and yeah, the stuff about him being impossible to find because animals ate him... All that makes sense too. But I don't care how hungry a grizzly bear gets. They don't eat whole ass canoes, and a big colorful canoe seems like it would be way easier to find. I get that they have a big area to cover in terms of search and rescue, but they've been looking for him for I think five years now, not counting 2020 because of everything getting scaled back because of you know what. I just don't get how in all this time... Not a single trace of my friend's dad has ever been found, and as far as other search and rescue efforts have gone, the authorities usually find some kind of evidence within that three to five year timeline. SNR workers find bones, bits of old clothing and equipment, and they find all kinds of things that prove someone didn't just disappear without a trace. But they've never found anything belonging to my friend's dad after they found his old campsite. 
I've heard people say that if fresh snow covered his canoe, then it might be a long time before any trace of him is found. But the more time that passes, the more it seems like my friend's dad has just disappeared into thin air. And if I find the whole thing as haunting as I do, then I can't even imagine how my friend and his family must be feeling. They put on a brave face, but I know they're still in pain, and they do just about anything to get some final and definitive answers. We're going back almost 20 years for this one. Talk about a trip down memory lane, but back around Halloween of 2005, I went camping with an old, obviously now ex, boyfriend of mine and three of his friends. I was kind of apprehensive about going at first because I was going to be the only girl among a group of four guys, and while I'd met my ex's friends before, I just felt like it'd be awkward if it was just me and four dudes who were broing it out for three nights. I also, and this might sound bitchy, but whatever did not completely trust my boyfriend and his buddies to A. pick a nice spot to camp, or B. want to do much of anything other than sit around a fire, grilling meat and drinking beer. Well, I was majorly wrong on both counts, and although there was plenty of grilling and sitting around a fire, the spot they chose was incredible, and they were nothing but perfect gentlemen, for the most part anyways. It turns out that two of my boyfriend's buddies were super into hiking and camping, so they weren't just about to pinch a tent anywhere and call it a camp. But when we arrived, I discovered they'd picked a truly beautiful site, and I'm not remotely exaggerating on account of being humbled so hard. There was a waterfall just down one of the trails, so we had clean drinking and washing water whenever we wanted. And speaking of trails... They'd pitch their tent close to where a bunch converged so we could go easy, medium, or hard, depending on how hungover we all were in the morning. It was the best of both worlds, it really was. Those guys were fun, they were polite, and most importantly, they gave me my privacy when I needed it, and didn't make any dumb awkward jokes about what me and my boyfriend would get up to in our sleeping bags, which was nothing because outdoors and that's kind of gross there. Anyways... Because it was late October, there were basically no other hikers around, which was fine with me because I got to use that waterfall to wash after we went hiking the next day. We had the trails to ourselves. No one drank too heavily the night before, so we were all relatively fresh and ready to put some miles in. Then, when we were done, we did some of the aforementioned grilling, drank a few more wine coolers and beers, and then all retired to our tents to get some sleep. As we were climbing into our sleeping bags, I remember telling my ex-boyfriend something like, Thank you for inviting me. This was unexpectedly awesome. And he kind of just laughed, because he'd been telling me the whole time not to worry, so for him it was totally vindicating to have me say that. But I meant it, truly. It hadn't just been awesome. It had been perfect. Right up until that next morning when we woke up and realized our perfect camping trip had taken a dramatic turn for the worse. So, there's a few things that I need to explain so what comes next will make more sense. Just after we caught it at night, but before getting into our tents, my boyfriend asked me to put the cooler and stereo in his truck while he doused the fire and collected up all our trash. I did as he asked, then put his truck keys in the front pocket of his backpack, which was situated on the side of the tent furthest away from the door, or flap, or whatever it's called, and on top of that, our sleeping arrangement was such that my ex-boyfriend slept closest to the door, and he had his firearm with him just in case anything crazy happened. We heard nothing that woke us up that night, woke up the next morning feeling fine, and we made sure everyone else was fine and awake too before we unzipped the door of our tent and looked outside. Before we went to bed, the campsite had been perfectly orderly, I guess, and when we looked outside that morning, not even eight hours later... It was complete chaos. The campfire my boyfriend and his buddies made had been completely destroyed, and some of the rocks we'd used to put around the edge to stop it from spreading looked like they'd been tossed around the campsite. All of my boyfriend's truck doors were open, the stereo had been smashed to pieces against a tree by the looks of things, and the cooler had been open, emptied, and tossed so that there was just raw meat lying all over the place. 
We all just sat there, poking our heads out of the tent in silence, in complete and total disbelief at what we were all seeing. And for me, the peace and quiet we enjoyed before wasn't so peaceful or quiet anymore. Everything just felt completely off. As we all got dressed and got out of our tents, we tried to figure out what had happened, or more importantly, how our campsite got wrecked without anyone hearing the destruction and waking up. But what started out as frightened discussion very quickly escalated into accusations and arguments. My ex accused me of not locking the truck the previous night, which made me furious because I said, do you think I'm dumb, stupid, or dumb? I swore on all that was holy that I locked his damn truck because I had a crystal clear memory of locking the truck door then putting the keys in his backpack, which as I said earlier was as far from the tent flap as it was possible to be without being outside the tent. He then marches over to the tent, grabs his bag, but there were no keys in the front pouch, and things escalated from there. My ex says, are you that stupid, huh? And then started demanding an apology, but the second I realized that there were no keys in the front pouch, I felt sick. I don't know if you've ever had a genuine moment of feeling like you're losing your mind, but it's not fun. I actually felt kind of lightheaded, dizzy almost, and then I retracted my steps towards my boyfriend's truck and found the keys lying near one of the open doors. I kept stammering and stuttering, not being able to get my words out, and it was only that my boyfriend realized that something else was going on. Or at least, that's what it seemed like on the surface. He went very quiet, said he just wanted to leave, and then after apologizing to his friends, we threw what was left of our stuff into his trunk and then got the hell out of there. I still remember feeling very strange during the ride home because I felt like I was going crazy. I was half apologizing, half begging him to believe me that I had this super clear memory of locking his truck, and it was making me feel like I was going nuts. He stayed quiet for a long time, until I started to cry, at which point he started saying stuff like, I know, I'm sorry, I believe you. That didn't really do much to calm me down because it still didn't answer the question of what the F happened to us the previous night. So I kept asking my boyfriend what he thought happened because he had way more camping experience than I did, and if anyone would know, it was him or his buddies. He just kept saying that he didn't know over and over until things got quite heated and we had to pull into the parking lot of some diner just to take a break from driving and actually talk things out. I don't care if some of you choose not to believe me over this because what I'm about to tell you is the God honest truth. This isn't word for word for my boyfriend said but he did say something to the effect so if you're going to choose not to believe anyone it's him you should be mad at and not me. Besides I have my own theories of what happened but we'll get to that afterwards. And so we stop in the diner parking lot, I think it was like an original pancake house but I can't be certain, and my boyfriend starts trying to find the words to tell me something. I'm asking him to talk to me, but it's like he can't get words out, and then he starts telling me how I'll think he's crazy if he tells me what he's thinking. I told him it couldn't be crazier than a feeling than the one that I'd felt back at the campsite when I realized the keys were missing, then after gathering his thoughts he started to speak. He told me that the previous night, he'd had a bad dream. Not like a full-on nightmare, but enough to wake him up with a startle before he went back to sleep. He said at the time that he woke up, he didn't hear any movement or commotion outside the tent, which is how he went back to sleep in the first place. It just seemed like a dumb dream, possibly induced by drinking too much alcohol and then exhausting himself with hiking. He kept talking like how he hadn't really thought about what happened in the dream until I freaked out about the keys being out of his bag. I told him to just spit it out and tell me what his point was, and then he started to tell me what happened in his dream. He said that he dreamed that he woke up, in our tent, with me asleep next to him, but then he noticed how someone was crouching over him, like one foot on either side of his sleeping bag. He said he was terrified at first, but when he saw that the guy's face looked all wrong, like it was made of ski mask material, he wasn't just wearing one, he realized, oh, this is a dream, I better wake up. Then, as I said already, he did wake up, but he just kind of chuckled to himself that he was still having bad dreams as a 20-something adult and went back to sleep. 
I think it was probably a little too harsh of him in the moment because I said something like, what the F does that have to do with anything, when I'd just been encouraging him so hard to share that story. When I thought he was going to say something about hearing movement outside our tents, not start talking about a dream like it was somehow connected to what had happened, he wouldn't talk anymore after that. Instead, he went into the diner, got us some coffees, and then swapped apologies before we got back on the road again. Neither of us had been in our right minds. We were both frightened and confused, so nothing that happened on the way to the diner seemed all productive. We just drove back home. He dropped me off at my place, I took a shower, and then took a nap once the adrenaline had worn off. But all under the assumption that we were going to talk about what had happened. But when I called him later on that day, he said that he didn't want to talk about it. He said that he met up with his friends, they talked it over and they decided that it was best that everyone just kind of move on from that. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. They didn't even want to go to the cops or the park rangers or whoever deals with that kind of stuff. My ex said that there was no point, that they wouldn't be able to do anything, so now the only thing for us to do is to try to move on and forget it even happened. Again... I could not believe my ears. My ex was incredibly protective over his truck, and he was always up to date with his insurance payments, but then, in order to file a claim, he had to file a police report. I thought that that would be the tipping point, the thing that made him think, okay, maybe I should stop being an idiot and let the cops know someone could have potentially murdered us while we slept. He loved that truck, and it was everything to him, so I really thought that the whole insurance claim thing would make him change his mind, but it didn't. I have my own theories on why this is, and they all revolve around one reoccurring theme, and that is how I think it was my ex-boyfriend that trashed our campsite. I don't know if you could describe it as a blackout or whatever, but I think he did way more in the middle of the night than just wake up from a bad dream. I think he knows it too, but I think at the moment the idea of acknowledging that he had a vague memory of smashing his own stereo was just impossible. I think it scared him scared him really bad and that's why he didn't want to revisit that night in any way, be it talking about it or even thinking about it. He also didn't want his friends talking about it and he especially didn't want me talking to them about it because I think he knew we'd figure it out sooner or later. I don't think he really cared about his smash stereo but he gave more than just two craps about what his friends thought of him and the last thing he wanted in the world was for them to think that he was going crazy or that he was dangerous in a way that was beyond his control. Now we broke up less than a year later, and I'd be lying if I said the whole camping incident wasn't a small contributing factor. One of the last things I told him was that if there ever comes a day when he feels like getting help, then I'll be there for him to support him through it. I don't think he's ever tried, and what happened that night is just something he's learned to live with. I don't know all this for certain. I mean, it's all just a theory. A game theory on my part. But the thing that makes me think that I'm not all that far off the mark is that, to my knowledge, he never ever went camping again. My girlfriend has a story from back when she was in her 20s, but since she's not a listener and doesn't want to write it up, I have actually asked permission from her to tell it. She grew up in Buffalo, New York, and she went to college at NYU, so after discovering that she had a few free days in October, she drove back to Buffalo to go glamping with some friends. She and four of her friends, who were all either 19 or 20, drove out to a campsite complete with cabins, campfire rings, and picnic tables. Then as they were unpacking their stuff, my girl and her friends saw that they had some neighbors who just so happened to be four guys of similar ages. They got talking, then one of the guys asked if they wanted to share a few beers come sundown once both groups had lined their stomachs. My girl and her friends said sure, then when the time came, they met up around the girls' picnic table to get the party started. As the night progressed, things got wilder and wilder, but everyone was still having fun and getting to know each other. Then at one point, one of the guys goes into their cabin and walks back out with a gun that he claims was his dad's. He's waving it around like some jerk-off and everyone is telling him to go put it away because there's literally no worse idea than messing around with a gun when you're drunk. The guy with the gun starts telling them to chill, how the gun isn't even loaded, 
and to prove it, he points into the air and pulls the trigger two or three times. No shots were fired, but the group still aren't happy about the fact that he's waving a gun around and being a general douche about bringing it with him. They're telling him to go back into the cabin and put the gun away, and that he should probably try to get some sleep too because he was way too drunk, exhausted from the day's events and acting way out of the ordinary. The guy with the gun takes major offense to this, I guess, and after proving the first two chambers of his gun were empty, he puts it to his head and pulls the trigger. Now, this next part of the story is where almost everyone guesses what happened next, and 99.99% of the time, they're dead on the money. That third chamber of the revolver, the one he pulled the trigger on after putting it to his head, had a bullet in it. Hell knows how it got there, if he loaded it and forgot, if someone else did, or he didn't properly check before he threw it into his bag or whatever, but regardless of what happened, the guy blew his brains out right there in front of everyone. As you can imagine, the scene descended into chaos, but my girlfriend said the things she remembers more than anything were the screams and the crying. She and another girl focused on giving the guy medical attention and directing 911 to the cabins, but my girl said the first aid the other girl performed was just that, performative. She knew the guy was dead, or rather he wouldn't survive the night, but she had to do something to try and calm everyone down before the situation got even worse somehow. She said it took like 30 minutes to get the cops and EMS out there, and by that time, the mood was completely desolate. She said one guy was almost catatonic, like he was so freaked out at losing a friend like that that he completely shut down and stopped talking completely. Another person, one of her friends, wouldn't stop crying. But she wasn't just crying. She was bawling her eyes out non-stop, as if every time she calmed down a little, she saw the whole thing in her head again, and the cycle started all over. For quite some time afterwards... My girl and all her friends displayed symptoms of what the doctors called acute stress disorder, which from what I could gather is kind of like a precursor to PTSD. It's a lot of the same symptoms, but if they persist for more than a few months, then you officially have PTSD. Thank God three out of four girls, my girlfriend included, got better after a few days and a few weeks. But the girl, who couldn't stop crying... She was on medication for PTSD for literally years afterwards, and even today she says that night ruined her entire life. The whole thing had made her very anti-gun and it's definitely flavored my own opinions on all of that kind of stuff. I'm still a believer in the second amendment and I'm a gun owner myself, but I feel like there's a real gray area on the rules surrounding firearm ownership. Having guns in the hands of a good sensible person is a good thing and it always has been, and it's never been the problem. It's just when those guns get into the hands of young, intoxicated idiots, that's when something that makes me feel safe turns into something that scares the ever-living crap out of me. I grew up in central London and led a very urban existence during my childhood and teenage years. Then one day, I saw one of those celebrity survival programs, the kind where they put some soap opera star through some grueling survival scenario. It got me thinking, did I have what it takes to survive in some kind of disaster or post-apocalyptic situation? Or would I struggle and starve like some scared little Londoner, lost without a branch of pret a manger in which to buy a dizzyingly expensive sandwich? I tried to talk to my mates into coming with me, but they all thought that I sounded mental. When I first proposed a camping trip, they all pictured a clean and tidy five pound a night campsite with a pub nearby, but when I told them that I was planning something a little less leisurely, they dropped out one by one. I'd already come across the whole solo camping thing online, so I knew that it was a thing people did. It just became a question of biting the bullet and heading out on my own to see if I had what it takes. Well, turns out I was a little bit tougher than I thought I was, because although I didn't exactly thrive in Ashdown Forest during that first trip, I didn't die, and I actually really enjoyed myself too. 
I'm not going to give you all the cliches about feeling one with nature or how beautiful but brutal it is to live like our primordial ancestors. Now don't get me wrong, they definitely apply but for me, it was how it made all my first world problems seem like just that. Stuck waiting at a busy bar for two pints and a packet of crisps, at least you're warm and you're dry and you're indoors. Pizza delivery driver taking the mick to show up, at least he's on his way with hot appetizing food that's not just come out of a can. I felt like it was great for my mental health, having everything put into perspective like that, and it was also pretty cool that I got to practice some legitimate survival skills. When I got back, my mates assumed that I'd be like, never again boys, that was horrible, but to their surprise, I told them that I couldn't wait to get back out there. I went on about three or four more solo trips over the course of about two years, going to different forests each time. Then finally, I decided to plan a trip to Scotland, or more specifically, to a place called Galloway Forest Park. It's only a few hours drive over the border, and it's a very accessible forest, but it's unique in that it features some of the most remote wildlands in the entire British Isles. Picture a giant ring road. 15 to 20 miles apart in places and in the center is nothing but wilderness, which means once you're in the middle, it's about two days walk across extremely rough terrain to find the nearest functional road, let alone any real civilization. When I first read about it, it seemed like the ideal place to really put myself to the test. So the first chance I got, I booked a few days off work, took out a small loan to be able to afford the train up there. I'm joking, but we're not far off it seems, and then off I went to Galloway on a damp September morning. I drove all the way up to a small town named Newton Stewart and then spent the night at a small backpacker's hostel called Glen Mollick Lodge, where I paid a few extra quid for them to watch my car for a few days until I got back from my wild camp. Like my mates back home, the people who owned the lodge also thought that I was mental, not so much for what I was doing, but where I was doing it, and the fact that I was choosing to do it alone. They reminded me that where I was going, there'd be no mobile phone signal, and only a ranger's lodge up near a place called Burnhill. Everywhere else was complete wilderness, meaning if I got hurt, the chances of running into someone who could actually fetch help were as minimal as minimal could be. They made no bones about telling me that what I was doing was foolish, but to me, the risks only added to the challenge. Then, on top of that, I was most definitely experienced enough to handle all the field craft and navigation, so after a good night's sleep in a soft, warm bed, off I went to spend four nights in a sleeping bag, hiking around one of the wildest and most remote places in the whole of the United Kingdom. I used to get excited about each and every one of my wild camping trips, but if I'm being honest, that excitement wouldn't be anywhere near as intense if it wasn't mixed with a dash of fear. Being on your own, out there in the middle of nowhere, there's a feeling of vulnerability that comes with it. We don't have many hunters or dangerous predatory animals in the UK, so I know it's a damned sight safer than hiking in the American wilderness, but there's still this feeling of it being you against the world, and sometimes... That can feel very spooky indeed, especially after dark. I remember on day two of four, while walking towards a spot on my map marked Silver Flow, I started to wonder just how isolated I really was. It was mid-September, so hardly prime hiking season, so by the afternoon of day two, I reckoned that I was at least a full day's walk away from even having the chance of seeing another living person. That kind of seclusion was a bit nerve-wracking, but that was the idea and ironically, it brought on this feeling of absolute freedom. I could do whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, without anyone being able to impede or intervene. It felt a bit post-apocalyptic, a taste of what it might feel like to be the last man on earth, and the landscape of wild rural Scotland made it feel even more dramatically isolated and alien. Towards the end of the second day, I started looking for my second spot to camp, the land in front of me was mostly grass and small boulders, and there wasn't a single patch of trees in sight for miles and miles ahead of me. I needed trees for cover, to make a shelter, collect firewood, stuff like that, 
so I got out my little laminated map of Galloway and started looking for a patch of trees. According to my map, I had to climb this massive ridge line with an even taller hill at the end of it labeled Merrick. It looked like a hell of a slog, and it was, but I didn't have much of a choice unless I wanted to get caught out in the open at nightfall, so off I went. I remember getting near to the top of the ridge and being so exhausted that I stopped to take a rest. You have to remember, I was hiking with my life on my back. Food, water, shelter, tools, changes of clothes. Even when you try to pack light, you still end up with aching shoulders. I sat down on the hillside and looked out over the land below me, bare, rocky, and completely treeless. Not a single thing moved down there and I could see for miles and miles, and then the same could be said for the other side of the ridge too. The views were incredible, and although there were, thankfully, a few patches of trees, there wasn't a single person, vehicle, or even road in sight for as far as the eye could see. I'd never been anywhere quite like it. The English countryside is set up so that even when you go to quite remote places, there's still a capillary system of winding lanes, little cottages, and even the occasional country pub. But in the Scottish countryside, there really are actual, barely touched wilderness areas, and it almost feels like you step back in time. I felt completely and utterly alone out there, and it was everything I had ever hoped it could be. But as the saying goes, be careful what you wish for. After a quick rest, I made my way over the ridge line, and then pushed on for about half a mile towards a large patch of trees. Once I got there, I set up my shelter, which consisted of little more than a waterproof poncho strung up between two tree trunks, and then set about making a campfire and cooking some dinner. All of that took a hell of a lot of time, but by the time I was finished with dinner, I had maybe a half an hour's worth of daylight to collect some firewood, make myself a cup of cocoa, and then I had to try and get some sleep if I wanted to be up again for six in the morning. The last thing I did before I lay down on my bedroll under my shelter and climbed into my sleeping bag was place my mug of cocoa down at the edge by my campfire. It was still lit, the fire I mean, and it was kind of an experiment to see if the remains of the fire would keep the last of my cocoa warm. There was only about a fifth of the cup left and it would be no loss if it had gone cold by the morning. So I placed the cup carefully down next to the stones that I'd used to ring the fire, then trying to get some rest. That second night's sleep is always much better than the first. You don't sleep well on the first night of any wild camping trip because there's still that shock of capture feeling where you're not quite comfortable living outdoors yet. It's not even an experience thing, at least it wasn't with me. Your conscious mind is like... Wild camping, easy peasy, done this before, but your subconscious overpowers it with, this is a strange place and we don't like it. So no matter how tired you are and no matter how much hiking you've done across hills and marshes and god knows what else, you still can't quite achieve that deep REM sleep that results in you waking up feeling refreshed. But then that second night, you start feeling just that little bit more comfortable sleeping outdoors, then, combined with just how bloody knackered you are from your second day's hike, your sleep is faster and you sleep deeper. Needless to say, I felt much better rested than the previous two months. I pulled myself out of my sleeping bag, put my boots on, then as I was tying the laces up, I remembered the smidge of cocoa that I'd left next to the campfire. I'd looked over to the fire, which by then had long since gone out, but the little enamel cup that I'd carried with me was gone. I had one of those, wait, did I wake up and I just don't remember it kind of moments? Or I sat and racked my brains for any memory of checking on my little experiment. I was in such a groggy state from having just woken up that when I saw my mug sitting on a nearby log, just perfectly balanced on the top of it, I honestly thought to myself, I don't remember leaving it there. And then it hit me. I hadn't moved it from near that fire. Someone else had. In the moments following that realization, it was like the whole world changed in a split second. In one world, I was at peace, feeling well rested and excited to get on with my day. But in another, I was not alone. I was not at peace, and I was not excited about how I was going to spend the rest of my day. But above all, 
I felt that I was in danger. I went from casually tying my laces to frantically nodding and tucking them, then I grabbed my knife, stood up and began looking around to see if anyone was there. It's not a larger knife by any means, but the five inch folding Victorinox was all that was standing between me and complete defenselessness. I unfolded the blade as I looked around, but I couldn't see anyone. Then, as I was looking, I had this moment of second guessing myself. My thoughts were going a mile a minute, so I started wondering if I hadn't just managed to freak myself out a little bit. I had no memory of moving the cup, but that didn't mean that I didn't, if that makes sense. So, just to make sure, I walked over to the cup balanced on that fallen log, but my head still on a swivel because I'm still not entirely sure if I'm alone or not. Then, when I'm close enough, I had a look at the cup, and I saw something inside of it. The bit of hot chocolate that I'd had left in it was gone, but sitting in the cup was a piece of long grass that someone had tied into little knots up and down the stem. And that was most certainly the work of someone else. It's funny how certain idioms are completely abstract until you personally experience them. Like when people say, it was an emotional roller coaster, I used to take that to just mean it was very emotional. But until you've experienced that fluctuation between fear, self-delusion, confusion, and terror, I feel like you don't really appreciate why people say things like that. I went from perfectly content, to frightened, to slightly calmer but confused, to absolutely terrified when I saw what was in that cup. Someone had put it in there, and they'd obviously spend time tying the blade of grass in delicate little knots, maybe even while they sat right there on that log, watching me sleep like the dead after that long second day's hike, like their creepy little way of saying hello. I know some people reading this, especially those unfamiliar with the great outdoors, are going to be thinking something along the lines of, so what? Someone came along and moved your cup, what's the big deal? They could have hurt you, they could have robbed you, but they didn't. They left you a nice little present instead to be funny. Well, that's just the point, isn't it? They could have done anything they bloody well wanted to me. They could have picked up a rock from the ring around my campfire and smashed my head in with it. But then they also could have just buggered off and kept minding their own business. I mean, really think about it. If they had completely pure intentions, why move my stuff around to begin with? It was to say that exact thing, I could have done whatever I wanted to you, and I had all the time in the world to do it. If that's someone's idea of a funny prank, then fair play to them, but as a solo wild camper, having people sneaking around your camp when you're asleep is a big, big no-no, and the danger doesn't so much lie in the act itself as the potential for escalation. If someone was able to sneak up to your camp to maybe steal something or otherwise give you a scare like that happened with me, the chances of it being a one-time thing are very slim. Or rather, you've got to make sure it's just a one-time thing. Maybe if they choose to escalate, you could be in deep trouble. A little bit of a prank could escalate into a big one, or if they felt emboldened and a little less playful, a group of locals would do some serious damage before I got to my knife, at which point the outcome was unthinkable. But that in turn got me thinking, and this is the kernel of mystery at the core of this whole thing, who the hell just happened across me in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night, too? The only explanation I can think of is that there was some other solo camper or group of them who came across my shelter while looking for their own place to sleep and decided to mess with me a little bit as a joke. They're the only people who are out there just wandering around random patches of trees, and the forest rangers stationed over five miles away know better than to go wandering around in the dark. I also can't reconcile the fact that only about an hour or so before I made my way into that patch of trees, I got a bloody good look at the areas both ahead of me and behind me, and I didn't see a single trace of anyone, be it smoke trails, old campsites, or actual people moving around over the wilderness below. So unless someone was moving in and out of the area, really quickly, like a fast packer or something, I'm pretty sure I'd have seen some trace of them during my arrival or departure. I say all this now like I was thinking it through in the moment, and some of it I was considering, 
but I was considering it as I was throwing all my stuff back into my bag because there wasn't a cat in hell's chance that I was staying there another night. But therein lay the real problem. I couldn't just leave. I was a day and a half's walk from the nearest road, and that was if I changed my intended course dramatically to reach the nearest highway. Unless I wanted to risk a repeat incident, I'd have to walk all day and all night, but at the end of it, I'd be at a place called Glentrul, where I could get a bed and some hot food and then make my way home when I slept off the exhaustion of walking for like 24 hours straight. It didn't sound like it'd be much fun, but it was that, or sleep out in the open for one or maybe two more nights, and there was no chance that I was about to risk that. The journey to Glentrul took me westward, back over the ridge line that I had crossed less than 24 hours before. It gave me another chance to look over miles and miles of almost treeless wilderness which spread across all directions. But once again, I didn't see any sign whatsoever that anyone else was out there with me. I stopped to look around, once at the peak and then once again when I got to the bottom, just on the off chance that I caught someone following me over the ridge. But again, there was no one. It was like the entire landscape was dead and I even sat there a few minutes just waiting and watching for any sign of anyone. It was quite surreal, really. All the times that I'd been wild camping in much less remote places and I'd never had anyone sneak up on me while I was sleeping let alone try and deliberately scare me by moving my stuff around. Of all the places I thought something like that might happen, Galloway would have been my very last pick. But then that's what made it so unsettling for me. If I was anywhere else and someone decided to start messing with me, I'd have some phone signal and probably a few other hikers or campers around to lend a hand. But out there, in arguably the most remote place in the whole of the UK, it was just me and whoever the hell had been walking around my campsite while I was asleep, and I had absolutely no clue where they were or if they were still watching me. The only choice I had was to get the move on again as soon as possible, but I simply cannot overstate the feeling of vulnerability I felt while beginning to walk westward. I was on the opposite side of the ridge, the one with even less cover than the side that I made my camp on. I had miles to walk with nowhere to hide and as much as I kept turning around and not seeing anyone there, I was never quite 100% convinced that I wasn't being watched. I walked all day, 13 hours until full dark, until my feet were literally killing me and I could feel the blisters forming on my heels. I stopped once or twice to eat a cereal bar or drink some water but the greater function of those breaks were to get a good look around me and make damn sure that I wasn't being followed. Again, it was easy to see that there was no one in sight. The horizon was dead for miles around, but I had to operate under the assumption that I was being watched. If I didn't, and I put my guard down and tried to camp for the night, I could end up paying a very high price for it. I consider myself very fortunate that I had the foresight to go on some easier solo camps before I attempted Galloway. If I hadn't, there's no chance that I'd have been able to stick to my plan and make it back to civilization without exhausting myself completely. But even with all the experience I had, pushing myself through the night was quite possibly the single most difficult thing I've ever done in my entire life. There were times that I felt so tired that I felt sick, and times when I didn't know if my mind was playing tricks on me, and there really was someone just feet behind me in the darkness. All I had to go on was my compass for direction and I had to walk at least half my normal speed to ensure that I didn't go arse over tit and roll an ankle, because then I really would have been rum-tuggered. And I went on and on, for hours on end until finally I looked over my shoulder to see dawn breaking behind me. But even more of a beautiful sight was seeing no one at all, just an empty space behind me. After I got home I promised myself that I'd be much more careful when it came to camping and hiking, and that just maybe, my days of flying solo were well and truly over. I can't say that it wasn't fun while it lasted. All those trips definitely gave me a confidence that I couldn't have otherwise, but it also gave me a wisdom earned from hard experience. There are some very strange, very creepy people out there, and sometimes I feel like I got away with just a warning. Hey friends, thanks for listening. 
Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday and Thursday at 9 p.m. EST, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday and Wednesday night. If you got a story, be sure to submit them over at my email at letsreadsubmissions at gmail.com, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks and bonus content for members of the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations located anywhere on your list of podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, you gooned too close to the sun, my friend.